One of my former students who, who has made an entire career out of basically environmental assessments is the perfect case in point in this. This guy started some 25 years ago in basically going into environmentally contaminated properties that no one would touch and effectively coming up with an accurate pricing scheme to remediate those properties for the environmental contamination that they had because everyone was afraid to touch them because they had whether it was the you know the, the asbestos you know in the flooring tiles or you know, mold or you know whatever <coughs> it, it might be and everyone you know just deeply 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 discounted the values of these properties to the point of just the, the absurd, you know, where you had a property that maybe would cost you $150, $200 a square foot to rebuild that was being priced at maybe $10 a square foot because all the lenders were scared to death of the, of the, the properties and, and you maybe had to pay cash for them in order to even acquire them. And, and the, the, the current owners were scared to death of them because they were afraid that somehow they were going to be you know, dragged into some sort of nightmarish experience of kind of being able to, to, to kind of, um, from a regulatory standpoint, be held responsible for some of these things. And so anyway, he came in with a, a number of other folks and they you know, concocted this whole scheme of, of figuring out how much does it really cost per square foot to do this sort of environmental remediation, you know, and you know, effectively coming up, doing an adequate pricing, and then realizing that, let's say that, that once again, you know, we've got a, a, a property, and the acquisition cost is here at let's say I'm just going to put this at ten dollars a square foot, and you know, the normal market price for this kind of property, uncontaminated just to keep things simple, was $100 a square foot. And if he was able to come in and sort of say, all right, we can obviously do the environmental remediation for something dramatically less than 90, the $90 difference, right. okay, it makes sense to obviously pursue this property, okay? Yeah. But what, you know, you'd be surprised, at, though, still, how many players out there in the market you know, just can't get over the whole thing of the property is environmentally contaminated, okay? And so they wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. So their approach was, okay, we'll come in, we'll do, we'll do the acquisition, we'll do the cleanup, we'll spend this amount of money, basically, on the, 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 the cleanup, which might mean that we have a total of, I don't know, let's say $40 a square foot total investment, um, $30 to do the cleanup, Ten dollars for the the acquisition, and then ultimately flip it for this price or something slightly less. Pocket the cash. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And all they were doing, they weren't even doing a full remediate or a full redevelopment of the property. They were just doing effectively the environmental sort of cleanup to get the property to where it's occupiable mm -hmm. again. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that is an example. Okay, of you know this sort of thing. Now, what would you expect has happened over the past 25 or so years? Do you think that sort of play still exists? Mm -hmm. yeah. Not as much, because obviously the market has gotten wiser. Okay, to where the spread has gotten much smaller. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. In other words, when they were the first in the market doing this. You know, there was a ton of opportunity to sort of find this because, you know, those sort of plays were everywhere. But over time, as people kind of began to sort of, well, look at them, they're doing this and they're making a lot of money doing this, then obviously cutting that spread down. Mm -hmm. yeah, but there have also been changes in terms of... Regulatory uh, issues, you know, a handful of other things that have kind of intervened in the, in, in, in the meantime. But it's just something, you know, what I'm, I'm talking though about is, you know, finding opportunity. You know, looking for those weird sort of, of niche markets that may sort of pop up. That is one example, okay? Another example, um, one that I dabbled in quite a bit, was to buy old deteriorating sort of, of commercial properties in, in a downtown core, and that had no longer, well, they were initially, like the, the first few properties that I bought, you know, were built in the late 1800s, okay? Matter of fact, the very first property I bought 
was built in 1890. It was a, originally a saloon and a whorehouse, okay? And it had been run as a saloon in downtown Bryan, Texas for many years until Prohibition, just down the street from Texas A&M University. It was a two-story shotgun kind of building, one of these 25 square feet, or 25 feet wide by 125 feet deep, two stories. And the building had gone through a number of uses where I bought it in the, in the late 90s. And um, basically it was, it was empty whenever I bought it. And the downtown area had virtually no retail, but yet what, it, what the, the opportunity was, it was just literally a block away from the courthouse. And so my thought was, all right, let's turn that downstairs into office space instead of trying to make retail work, which retail clearly didn't work there. And let's take the second floor and turn it in, which was none of the downtown buildings were using their second floors for anything other than storage. And so I said, well, let's turn that into a couple of loft apartments. So that was my first project of, of doing an actual redevelopment. You know, I bought several houses and did those before, but this was, you know, first commercial building. And so, you know, once again, first floor, turn it into office space, get that reconfigured, second floor, turn it into residential. Well, all of a sudden, the way in which the, the prices were on these properties is they were all being priced as if they were for retail. And there was no retail market down there, so what do you think? The prices were ridiculously low. I bought this building for $10 a square foot, okay? Now, it's hard to almost put your head around as to how cheap that is, okay? But, you know, 10 bucks a square foot and was able to effectively put about $20 a square foot in finish out, which was pretty minimalistic, because there wasn't a whole lot you really had to do, just kind of clean it out, put in some new electrical, new lighting, you know, some plumbing for the upstairs, and put some partition walls, that sort of thing. And then ultimately, rent it out initially to get it stabilized, and then sell it, you know, ended up selling it for about 80 bucks a square foot. You know, so my $30 a square foot investment, selling it for 80 bucks a square foot, which I still thought was below the market, but it was still, it was a nice profit. I'll take it, move on to the next project, okay? And so my, my point being is, you know, you sort of look at, at opportunities like that, and those are the kinds of things that I think are the more interesting, you know, from the standpoint of how do you then begin to transform that neighborhood by you know, not necessarily sticking with what the property has been used for previously, but you know, start to say, what can we do with it now that actually does meet you know, the needs of the market? I mean, yeah, I encountered a lot of resistance up front with a lot of the surrounding property owners. Oh, we don't want this to be office space or you know, residential. We want this to be retail. We want to rebuild this as a retail. Retail's not gonna work down there. You don't have people living down there. You don't have people, you know, um, you know, enough of a core to really draw people into a retail, you know, situation. And so what that whole area has since evolved into now over the past 15, 16, 17 years is it's almost exclusively office space with some retail, but a lot of new residential has sort of moved in then with entertainment of restaurants and bars, okay? And so the whole area has kind of rebirthed as you know, sort of a result of that kind of redevelopment process. But also what has taken place is that many of the buildings that, that I purchased, renovated, redid, you know, have all been put to effectively new uses. And the challenges, though, in many cases, of dealing with the local you know, building code officials, of, you know, because in the minds of, of so many people, what a building is built for must be what that building is used for forever in a lot of people's minds. You build it as a church, it must be a church forever. You build it as a retail center, it must be a retail center forever. You build it as an office building, it must be an office building forever. You've got to put that sort of stuff out of your head, but you've also got to help to educate the folks, the building code officials, to get them to kind of buy into, you know, this idea of, okay, yeah, it was built to be originally this use, but what is it going to take for us to come to an, an agreement realizing it's not going to be perfect? 
probably in their eyes or in your eyes as to what you may have to do to come into compliance with whatever building codes that they're going to you know, be concerned about. Because at the end of the day, what should the building code officials be concerned about? Two things. Public safety. safety. Public safety and public health. health. Okay, so health and safety should be their two overriding concerns. And so part of what you have to do to a certain extent is this educational process of kind of bringing them into the discussions and saying, okay, what do we have to do to satisfy you that people are going to be safe within this structure using it for the use that we have adapted it to? You know, are we going to have to put in wider staircases? Are we going to have to put in a sprinkler system? Are we going to have to put in um, you know, wider hallways? Are we going to have to put in you know, certain types of uh, um, uh, windows? Are we going to put in certain types of doors that are fire rated doors? Are we going to have, you know, all of those kinds of things, you know, those sort of discussions up front to sort of figure out what are your, going to be your extra cost to sort of come into compliance with these issues that potentially they throw at you. Now the thing to, to sort of point out with that is unfortunately every single local government is different. Okay? Every single one. Every single building code official is different. Okay? And it has been my experience through all the different projects that I've done in, in different areas that some of which these folks want to work with you. They really do. They really want your project to be successful and really you know, do want to, to try to help you. In other cases, whole different sort of attitude of like, we're not going to tell you, you know, what to do. You're going to have to figure it out and then we'll come back and we'll tell you what's wrong with it right. after you've done it sort of thing. Right. You know, so you know, a totally you know, different sort of, of, of approach. And I, and I know that you know, some of you guys have had experience with that, that sort of thing, and, and it can be a real challenge, you know, you know, even in a very simple you know, sort of retrofit, you know, not even taking it down to the guts and rebuilding it, but just sometimes you know, doing a minor renovation can trigger a whole number of things that you have to, to put into compliance. In a lot of cities, and I'm going to cut right to you, Dustin, you know, in a lot of cities, the moment that you pull a building permit, even for it's a simple renovation, a lot of times that will open up the barn door for them to sort of swoop in and say, there are all these other things we want you to fix as well. Yeah. Okay? That it's like you would have been better off, you know, never have, have starting than to, to potentially, you know, pull up that permit to, to do one little minor thing. Okay, Dustin? Did, did that building that you had have a parking lot or was it? No. On it's all on street parking. And you were able to to because it was a downtown area, and so the entire downtown area, the it was just shared parking. Did the zoning allow for that? Zoning was, thank goodness, was it was it was basically kind of a mixed use sort of of, of uh, you know open use. They had already kind of thought about from a, a downtown the, the the planning folks had already thought, look, you know these buildings have been through a multitude of uses. We're just going to call it the downtown zone, and we're going to pretty much allow almost anything and everything to you know take place there and then we'll just kind of deal with you know each one each issue but what I will tell you is when we, we did these first few projects the city was wonderful pretty much anything goes kind of you know you know we just sort of figure it out as we sort of go along but then as time progressed they became more aggressive they became also more educated but also in, in a lot of cases requiring you to do many more things raising that cost you know, to the point of where then it, it became, in many cases, financially unviable to actually, you know, do these things. And that's, that's a, it's a real balancing act, too, between these local governments because, you know, their, their senior building code officials, as a general rule, they are technically on the line for, um, you know, anything that happens in their jurisdiction, you know, in terms of, you know, that if they're not following the code, then to what extent they could be sued in the event that you know something you know burns up or blows up or whatever it might be, and so it's a question of you know how much they're willing to in one sense you know kind of put their reputation on the line. But in a lot of cases, you know, in my mind, it's whenever you can get those building code officials where they use common sense right. and just simply say, okay, look, we understand. 
you know, you're not going to be able to do this because of the way this thing is already built. The cost of you doing that would be just ridiculous and we know it wouldn't get done, so therefore we're going to give you a waiver on this and let you um, um, do what you can as close I mean, and then try to come up with some sort of a, of a solution. You, you had mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes when you go in for a simple permit and the barn, the barn doors yeah. kind of open up on you. Now, is there a way for you to know if when you purchase the property, it's in the status of legally non-conformant? Yeah, and the... Because that's why it's, they it's, would it's, hit it's, you no, it's, And that's a challenge. Each jurisdiction is different. But a lot of times, that um, most of the local governments will allow you, it may, they may charge you a fee to do so, but will you know, allow you to sort of grab one of their building code officials and sort of, and they, usually they have an information system about each property as well, and sort okay. of what permits have been pulled or what work has been done, or is there anything they've been cited for, violations and things like that, that they can pull up and see kind of a, a working history, and then initially can kind of give you, well, there was this bedroom on this property that was added without a permit, mm -hmm. and we know about it, and we've cited them, and that's the reason they're selling. Okay. Or, you know, in, in other cases, they'll do a, in, in, in my experiences, they would do a walkthrough with you and sort of say, okay, well, this building, because of its size and because of the new intended use, you're going to have to have a fire suppressant system put in. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to um, specifically have to have a couple of additional exit doors, or you're going to have to, you know, this, that, or the other thing um, that potentially may come into play. But, you know, they, once again, there may be a fee for that, um, but in, in other you know, locations where they really are wanting to get things, you know, moving in terms of a redevelopment of the area, then they, you know, will be much more usually accommodated. But it still is, it's a, it's a tricky business because you really got to trust them, you know, at their word that whenever you go into one of these situations and, and you know, you have a, one of these upfront meetings and, and then they're telling you, okay, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do, and, and then, you know, you've done all of that and then they come to you wanting you to do many more other things after you effectively come to an agreement, you know, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, I think that redevelopment, it's always complicated. It has a lot of rewards, but it's always complicated, especially if you want to change zoning. And depending on the jurisdiction, land planners, they, they plan uh, a city and, and, and zoning depending on the inputs and the outputs of the economy of that particular city. And if you come with a plan and an analysis of shift sharing analysis and explain to them how it, the, it, it evolved since they uh, sold that property um, office, for office only, and you show them how it evolves the population, the economy, what are the outputs that that particular building that you're intending to use um, will bring to that particular city and the kind of inputs that it will generate. That's also that it's very helpful to change your mind in zoning, mm -hmm. especially when you're dealing with uh, commercial that will bring, for example, a lot of uh, employees to a city. Or additional uh, tax revenue, if nothing exactly. else. Exactly. So that shift sharing analysis is, is very important for the land planner to allow you to change uses. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that, that I wanted to ask, uh, add on is going back to risk. Risk is today one of the most challenging things in investing in real estate for redevelopment. And in my experience, uh, a, a risk scorecard, model scorecard, allows you to pinpoint the real versus the perceived mm -hmm. to get you to a real IRR that you can live with, with the real and the perceived. Yeah. And to and to manage the own known, so I think that's something that you have to take into account. No, I agree completely. Is it hard to rezone a property, or it, once again, totally dependent upon the jurisdiction? Yeah. I mean, because uh, some cities, I mean, it's like literally you come to them, you know, you pay them a, a couple hundred dollars for the the rezoning request, you go in and have a quick little public meeting. They you know do a, another public meeting, and it's approved within a, a matter of a month. Other, you know, jurisdictions, you know, it can be a long, protracted, complicated process that lasts, in some cases, years, you know, of, of literally just trying to rezone a property. And so, you know, you really, once again, that's one of those sorts of things you have to kind of understand and, and sort of feel, you know, um, that you're comfortable with. As a general rule, smaller cities are usually a little, uh, usually, a little bit easier to deal with only from the standpoint there are fewer players. 
and that hopefully you can kind of you know, feel out pretty quickly if you've got a consensus to be able to kind of move things forward versus you know larger cities where you know many more players and and um, you can just kind of hope that well you kind of get lost in the system but in a good way that you know um, works to your favor but uh, it, it's you know, in no way shape form or fashion should you, you know, kind of go into the situation and automatically assume that you're going to get you know a rezoning but you know, and hopefully in a lot of cases even with some of these repositionings it may not be necessary it may be that already and, and that would be you know, one of the first things to look at what are the allowable uses within this area and maybe we're just not putting this property to the use that may be the most productive nice and best. you know the whole notion of highest and best use of you know saying that you know um, it could very well be used as office space it could be used as retail it could be used as residential and that may already be allowed you know especially in a, in a downtown area by virtue of mixed use you know sort of zoning that simply says well any of those uses are acceptable Okay. Okay. Thoughts, comments? It seems like parking is always like like the biggest problems. Yeah, it is in a lot of especially in you know, the more concentrated areas. It's it's one of the reasons that, you know, even to a certain extent, you know, areas even like downtown Fort Lauderdale have, you know, issues of you know being able to attract, you know, that really core of, of getting this area completely redeveloped and kind of you know worked a thriving 24 hour a day kind of, of hub um, you know they're still struggling with that oh. and do they have like this parking garage over here is that like can a developer I mean you use? know they can try to yeah they can partner but you know once again there's a question of well what is the cost you know of, of doing that um, and, you know and is it going to be something that the uh, you know the users of the space are going to be able to afford and, and versus you know, somewhere that's maybe a little bit further out that has free parking, and having to you know factor that in. Those are what do you say? Parking is is always a why is well, parking? Well, because I mean, like for you know, for example, the, the the place that you did in Texas, I mean, it's it's uh you know, it's used as retail, which may have a less uh, less space restriction than if you have residence and office. You know, maybe retails. I don't know what retail is, but well, yeah, but like the office is you know one yeah. one car per three hundred square foot. Right. And once again, that varies from location, you know, from city to city as to what those parking requirements are going to be. Um, you know, in a downtown core, usually they're fairly relaxed because they yeah, sort yeah, of expect it's the shared and off street parking and, and you know parking structures and that sort of thing. Um, but then other areas, you know, very rigid on you know how many spaces you must have per square foot of. Whether it's residential, right. retail, office. Because even in retail, it depends on the type of retail that you have in there. You lease the because of park attorneys. Yes. Yeah, I think with uh, yep. with Dave, that was, I mean, it was the like easiest thing we could have done. Pay hey, the rent. But you know what was fascinating <laughs> was there was virtually no office space at the time yeah. that was really down there for you know all the attorneys were located you know elsewhere in the city, and uh, you know, it seemed to me it was just like. This is obvious. Yeah. You know, so what's happening with this courthouse? It's just, you know, it's what, what would you? Why would you not do that? But you know, it's it, but it's just interesting whenever you're part of that whole thing and you sort of begin to see all those swirling parts begin to kind of and then, you know, at some point you reach that critical mass of where you're no longer kind of the the lone soldier out there, you know, doing this stuff. You've got now a lot of other people, you know, kind of coming in and and you know buying and, and several properties that I bought. It was like before I could even get to redeveloping them, somebody offered me, you know, considering more money than I paid for it. So I'm like, okay, you know, <laughs> and just walk away and let them take it on, you know. Um, okay. Why didn't, why didn't you want to do offices on both floors? Why you... Because it didn't have an elevator, and I would have, for ADA access, would have had to put in an elevator. But for residential, I didn't have to. Okay. And what it did have, it it, it had an act. Yeah, it was cost because at the minimum cost, the elevator would have been about thirty grand. Just for a simple, basic, nothing fancy, really. And uh, what it had, which was kind of interesting, one of the previous owners had put in a mechanical elevator, totally non-compliant, but it was it was really cool. I kept it in there, was able to keep it in there. I had to close it off um, in terms of uh, kind of close it in a little bit. But it was one of these old school. It, it was actually originally from a lumber yard, and it was one of these that had like the pull ropes. Oh no! Wow. And, uh, you know, but it was great, you know, for the residential tenants being able to move furniture, 
up and down, you know, so you'd have to try to carry it down the stairs. But anyway, it was, it was, a, it was an interesting feature. And originally, the, the building code official was like, you're going to have to take that out of there. And I'm like, why? And well, because it's going to be considered a fire, you know, hazard, and, and, and so well, how can I solve this? And that was one of those issues of okay, you've got to completely enclose the thing, and you know, on the on the on the downstairs, so nothing can you know um, keep up. And um, after that, yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, and, and dudes that like to live in lofts, they actually like it. Yeah, no, it, it was a very it was one of those very industrial sort of you know things, because you had the. Once again, the 1890s, you know, exposed brick walls, and, and I, you know, kept the, the ceiling all exposed, put in the uh, uh, final backed insulation up in, into the to the rafters, and then, you know, had a combination of the hardwood floors and tile. You know, it, was, it was really cool. Um, okay. So, moving beyond that and kind of talking about maybe another aspect to sort of think about with regard to kind of adaptive reuse is flexible use. And for those of you that have been in the program a little bit, I've talked a little bit about this before, but I think it, it merits kind of revisiting because I think there's some real opportunities here. And that is the notion of flexible use. Now, my definition of flexible use is where you have a property that can be converted from one use to another virtually overnight, okay? This is the whole thing of where you have, and you start beginning to look at space as space, okay? Just simply, you know, how can I take this space that we're located in right now, obviously it's being used as a classroom. What can it be used for with virtually no renovation whatsoever? Office space, Office. okay? Probably doesn't make any sense whatsoever as retail space because of its location and configuration, right? In order to make it residential space, what would we have to do? Put in a kitchen and bathroom. Okay, does everybody kind of follow what I'm sort of saying? So, but yet now, what if we were on the ground floor? You know, in this space, we're literally looking out over the, the parking lot there. Then that begins to open up the possibilities. Well, it might very well work as retail space. Okay, you kind of begin to see what I'm, I'm, I'm sort of saying. And so one of the, the, the notions that, you know, I'd like for you just to begin to think about, kind of in theory, is the whole thing of, you know, let's say that you've got a property, and one of my uh, sort of, I think, fun dream developments, if I can ever find one that's priced, uh, well, this is what I want to do. I want to take one of these old, oil change places and turn it into a, kind of a, a mixed use thing. And you know the, the oil change place I'm talking about would be you know one where they've got a garage door here, you know, another garage door here. And then what we do is we put a traditional door here, traditional door here, and we've got another garage door on this side, another door here, garage door there. And then this space can be completely flexible. And potentially, you know, here in the middle Maybe we've got our bathroom and our kitchen here, same thing. Bathroom and kitchen, where we could reverse them and put them, you know, um, side by side, to, you know, get some economies of scale there. Um, but the idea is just like one big open space, and that could be potentially, if you had glass fronted sort of garage doors, could be office space because you can drive down the street. And actually, I think there's a uh, um, uh, architectural design firm, they've done just this down on, I think it's like third. They've got basically a storefront that is basically just a, a big garage door, but it's all glass front and then an entry door, and it's just one big open space. But the point being is this space, what keeps it from being retail, office, residential, could even be, <laughs> excuse me, could even be, you know, industrial, yeah. warehouse space. Um, in one sense, I mean, why could it even not be kind of like a bed and breakfast, you know? So it could even be, you know, hospitality space. I mean, do you follow what I'm saying? I mean, now, once again, that's kind of thinking a little bit broader than ordinarily we would think. But, but my point is, you know, with this whole notion of kind of adaptive reuse and redevelopment, we can't allow ourselves to be so constrained into, well, what was that building originally built for? And that's what we've got to use it for. I mean, all any of you have to do. How many of you have been to Europe? 
okay? And what do you notice whenever you go to most older cities in Europe? You see buildings that have been there for literally hundreds of years, yes? And do you think that those buildings that were originally built for whatever they were built for are still being used for the same exact use that they were originally built for? No. They've gone through probably, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 or more different uses over their lifespan. And they're totally, completely comfortable with that. But yet, here in the U.S., or certainly in certain parts of the U.S., we have a real hang-up, in a lot of cases, of effectively, um, you know, what a property was originally built for, and then ultimately, what is it currently being used for, and not allowing ourselves to sort of think beyond that. And my, my point in bringing that up is, think about all of these big box retailers that we have out there right now. Okay, some of which not doing so well and potentially are going at some point to either have to be torn down or repositioned. To me, one of the opportunity areas would be for folks to kind of begin to think, what can we do with some of these oversized sort of big box tenants? I read, I read an article on one of them the other day. What's happening to a lot of them is gyms. Yeah, well, gyms, churches, you know, yeah. just sort of community centers, you know, a handful of other things that, you know, potentially, uh, you know, what can we, you know, what uses, new uses can we find for potentially these obsolete buildings, okay? And so, you know, part of that creative process of you guys, you know, beginning to kind of think about, you know, how can we, you know, reposition an existing, you know, retail center into something totally different. You know, can we make it into an office park? Can we make it into, um, you know, effectively, uh, you know, some other, you know, recreational facility or, or public facility? You know, we have to begin to, to kind of think about what those opportunities, you know, might very well be. Thoughts? Agree? Agree. Okay. Um, all right, how are we doing on time here? Okay, 9.45. Uh, so, any sort of last minute sort of questions or observations on kind of the redevelopment stuff? Anything else that kind of pops into your head? Uh, well, I think that one of the pros of redevelopment is also that if it's an operating property, um, you can do it in stages. Yes. And still continue to receive cash flow and, and keep your cash on cash mm -hmm. even though it's low and do it as you progress so it's less cash intensive and allows you to plan uh, ahead and take your time to uh, put your, all your thoughts together and do the reposition if it's rebranding or whatever it right. is within a certain period of time. Not, you don't have to... Uh, Maybe commit to the whole brain, project all at once. Yeah, and yeah. do brain damage, doing due diligence, and, and to know exactly what you're going to do. Uh, sometimes due diligence is very short and you have to come up with uh, quick closing because it's a redevelopment, it's an opportunity. So cash flow in operations are different than when the box or the uh, uh, building is empty. Right. Well, one, one more final piece to sort of, you actually touched on something that, that um, resonated. Um, for many years, and it's only been with the recent history, this has become less of an issue, but many lenders tend to be focused on a particular project type as well. And some lenders will only lend on certain uses, okay? That you have certain lenders that are only set up to lend on, let's say, multifamily, or single family, or office buildings, or retail buildings, or hotels, because that's what they're comfortable lending on. That's what they have been sort of uh, experienced with. And so you throw a mixed use property at them and you know, all of a sudden, all the alarm bells go off because they're saying, "Well, we've only lent on office buildings in the past. We've only lent on retail buildings." And so, what had to happen for several years, and still to a certain extent happens, is that some of these mixed-use projects you see have multiple layers of finance for each of the respective uses. You may have the first floor retail with a loan outstanding with one re with one bank, but yet the residential component above being financed by a totally different bank and the office piece being financed by yet another, you know, potential lender and then the ownership structure totally separate and segmented as well um, because of the, you know, the, the differences that do exist between each of those product types. 
but you know, whenever you start to throw in you know, a flexible use property, that really begins to complicate things. And because you, know, what, you start changing the use, and you may be prohibited from doing so by your lender. That says, like for example, one of the more common things, at least certainly was the case in Texas, that you had, let's say, a condo project that you had built that you realized wasn't selling, and so what you wanted to do was to turn it into rental units, or effectively turn it from condo to multifamily residential, and the lender said, no, can't do it. Even though there was more than adequate demand to turn it into very high-end, expensive rental units, the lender said no, and the lender was just had to foreclose on the property, and, you know, I mean, you, know, you just sort of, like, shake your head, really? But, you know, so those are, you know, other issues that you potentially could face as well. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. Yeah. For the purposes of the blog, can we record the presentations? Yes. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Other questions, observations? Okay, cool. All right, we're going to take a quick little break. Um, Steve Genestra, the uh, real estate law instructor, I know is roaming the hallway out there, and he should um, get started here at uh, 10 o'clock, okay? So if you're in the law class, make sure you uh, hang around. Otherwise, once again, we are meeting every single week, so I will see you again for this course next Saturday at 8 a.m., same room. Well, unless, okay, you will get an email from me if we do have to change the, the venue and we go and meet at the office, but just pay attention to your Elvin email. Make sure you're checking it every single day. Thank you all. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 I never checked the typical uh, books, but everywhere I was looking for that book. Yeah, yeah, I took my time as well. Um, the normal bookstore never has our books. I didn't even think of checking them. About how the local folks are going to be uh, taking for we're going to be going to no, Key West, Cozumel, and uh, Grand Canyon to visit the projects there. Oh, yeah, so so I didn't and, uh, and, uh, they didn't have a new one, so I just ended up getting a used one. And but I think they have one more. He said that one was like in a worse condition. I didn't see it, but it's good that you had them under your resume. They're doing that. They're going to take this course anyway because they want to see the best yeah, yeah, I, mean, I can. Hopefully, the Constitution hasn't changed since the. Yeah, I don't think. What I heard of the. the Unfortunately. So you have the 7th edition? Yeah, I got the 7th edition. Okay. But uh, they were saying that the, the publisher <laughs> changed. Gotcha. Uh, he's, I think he said Not a publisher. Yeah. He said his was going to be the 7th. Okay. Pleasure. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. Thanks for getting here. Absolutely. Yes. Chat is delayed. Got a lot of good communication. Just drag me downstairs across the street. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go down. Good. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you should be here. I think it's actually all over. Okay. Thank you. Downstairs. <laughs> Out front. To so the okay, left. On Las Solas. Is it on the side? Yeah, Las Solas. Okay. Right on the right. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, that was freaking me out. Everywhere I looked for the book, it was like two plus. $100. And it just kept getting more expensive. Or it would, work, it would go from like $100 and then the next best one was like $250. I got some websites. I don't have some problem yet. I forget what it was. I had a bunch of them. Where'd you get it? Some websites where you can like get you know, ranks to use books depending on how good they are, blah, blah. I think it was like $100. Are you going to record the um, presentation?